Have you ever heard annoying clicks, pops, and glitches in Ableton as you're working on a project? You know what I'm saying when you're either recording or mixing and your computer basically starts to melt down because of overload on the CPU. On this video, I'm gonna go over my top 10 tips to reduce your CPU overload in Ableton. So let's jump in. Hey yo, it's Alex from MetaMind Music. And as always with this channel, it's my mission to help musicians such as yourself produce themselves by developing their mindset, expanding their creativity and connecting to their inner artist in a deeper way. By the way, happy new year, everybody. I got a new webcam here, so you can see a different angle of my space here. And I'm super excited to tackle this new year to get those musical goals achieved and just all in all have a great year. So I hope you're feeling the same. Let me know your music goals that you have this year before we continue. So what we're gonna talk about is reducing the CPU load, making sure that Ableton is not glitching out when you're recording and or mixing and just doing what we can to make sure our CPU is operating at the best that it can. So tip number one is to use multiple hard drives. So Ableton has a bunch of functions that it has to complete to actually play back audio for you at any point in time. And a great way to reduce CPU usage is to actually avoid traffic jams for all this information that Ableton is trying to collect to play back audio for you. So within Ableton, there's all sorts of things like the DAW itself, there's packs, there's the user library, there's third party plugins, and there's the audio samples that we record. And again, a great way to reduce the CPU usage is to have different hard drives to read and write different information at the same time. So it's not all on your main computer hard drive to find all that information in real time. So if you're interested in setting up multiple hard drives and doing that with Ableton, I've actually created another video about organizing files in Ableton and all that great stuff. So I'll link that in the card above if you wanna check that out. All right, tip number two is to invest in a solid state drive. So if you're on a Mac, you can go to um, about this Mac and then go into storage and you're gonna see your main hard drive of your computer. And I have a terabyte solid state drive as my main hard drive for my computer. So if you can, it's well worth investing in a solid state drive as your boot drive so that your computer can run off a solid state drive. However, if you don't have the capabilities to upgrade your computer to a solid state drive, you can always invest in an external solid state drive. So I also have an external solid state drive that I use for all of my audio files, okay? So all my samples, all of my packs, all of my user library lives on that solid state drive that is an external hard drive. All right, so let me show you a couple drives that you could look at if you're interested in upgrading to a solid state drive. The Samsung stuff is great. Just make sure that it's compatible with whatever computer you are using. And if you wanna go for a portable external drive that will work for any computer, I have one of these as well. I have a 500 gigabyte one, which is plenty of memory. You can also get a terabyte and it's relatively inexpensive to massively upgrade your CPU usage if you decide to use it for all of your audio. So your samples, your user library, your packs, all that stuff, it's gonna help you speed up that CPU. All right, tip number three is to play around with your buffer size. So in Ableton, command comma opens up our preferences. And if you go to audio, you're gonna see that we have a buffer size option right here under, size, under latency. And depending on the setting, will dictate how much CPU resources are required depending on the setting you hit. So if you want the least possible amount of latency for when you're recording, so that there's no delay between when you play something and when you hear it back, you're gonna to wanna to reduce this buffer size to the lowest that your computer can handle. However, you'll see that when I go to 32 samples with my crazy Ableton template here, even with a pretty strong computer, my CPU is hovering around 25, 26%, which is pretty high. So what I typically do is increase this buffer size to reduce that CPU overload. And depending on if you're recording or if you're mixing, you're gonna to wanna to play around with this. So if you're mixing and you have all sorts of crazy plugins, but you're not too concerned with recording new parts and making sure there's no latency, then go in here and increase your buffer size to whatever you need so that your CPU does not overload and you're not hearing all those clicks and pops. That is a super important setting to be familiar with. Another thing you can do is you can play with the sample rate. Um, I usually work at 48,000, but you can go to 44.1 and that will save you a little bit of CPU. 
However, it does degrade the quality of your audio a little bit, but in all honesty, it's very hard to notice those differences. So if you're really strapped for CPU space, you can always record at 44.1 as well, which is completely acceptable. And tip number four is to freeze and flatten a track. So if you have a track with a VST instrument on it or something or an effect that's just hogging so much CPU, you can actually freeze it to kind of bake in all of the effects into the sound and you can actually flatten it as well to convert it to audio and bake in all of the effects into the audio itself if you're happy with how it sounds. The only caveat to this is you can't change the parameters once you free something, but it's a great way to manage your CPU as you're working on a project. So I recorded this uh, drum loop real quick here. So let's play it back. So let's say this drum track was just taking too many resources. Let's say we have lots of effects. We have these crazy synths, whatever it may be. You can simply just right click on the track and freeze track. And what this will actually do is you'll notice that there's a blue kind of screen that goes over the device view here. And we can't change any of these parameters, okay? These are locked in and that's what saves you the CPU is it just kind of remembers the state of all those effects and devices. Uh, and you can't change it, but it's reducing the CPU requirement. And then if you wanna go farther, let's say this is what you want for the final sound of this track, you can actually right click once again and you can flatten the track and this will convert it to audio. All right, so now you'll notice that all of our effects disappeared and this got rendered to audio and this uses way less CPU resources if you're ready to commit your sound to audio. All right, tip number five is to disable any plugins that you're not using but are loaded onto your DAW. So for example, if you have EQs loaded on all of your tracks or compressors loaded on all your tracks by default, well, just them being loaded will take some CPU. So what you can do is if you're working with a plugin that is set as a default or if you have a plugin that you're not using but you wanna keep it there, you can simply hit zero on the plugin or hit this little yellow circle to disable that plugin. So that can go a long way and especially for very CPU intensive plugins. So on this return track, I have this Valhalla Supermassive uh, plugin, which sounds amazing, but it does take a lot of CPU. So if I'm not using this, I will go ahead and disable that so that it doesn't clog up my CPU. And keep in mind, you can also disable clips by selecting a clip and hitting zero, or you can actually disable tracks as well by selecting a track and hitting zero. So tip number six is to use effect returns for very CPU intensive effects. So delays and reverbs typically will use a ton of CPU. So for example, with this Valhalla Supermassive, if we would take this and paste this to every single track that we have, so our rhythm track instance, here's another instance, another instance. We're slapping this on like bacon strips, guitar, Guess what? Another instance. And if you load multiple instances of the same effect on various different tracks, it's going to add up because you have multiple copies of the same plugin affecting different tracks. So instead of having a reverb and delay on every single track individually or a different one, try to use those effect returns instead because when you do that, instead of me having individual reverbs on each of these tracks, we can actually send these tracks to a return that has that effect on it and affect multiple tracks with one single plugin. So this is a great technique to use, especially for reverbs and delays, not only for CPU usage, but also for mixing. If you then want to adjust the dry wet balance of your whole mix, you can adjust it from the return instead of having to go in every individual track and change all the reverbs and delays and try to rebalance your mix, it gets pretty hairy. So it's definitely a good practice to learn. All right, tip number seven is to close all the programs that you don't need. And I'm very guilty of this because I have a very powerful computer. I just have a bunch of programs always open, which is foolish. However, if you're really hurting for CPU, closing down any other programs while you're using Ableton will actually help that tremendously. So if you're on Mac, you can go to Spotlight and you can type in Activity Monitor, bring up this app, and it will show you how much CPU 
every app that you have is using. So you'll notice OBS is using a ton of resources. We got live. So the amount of CPU that each of these applications uses pops up in the activity monitor on Mac. If you're using Windows, just there's the equivalent, just search it up. So it's a good practice to close down any programs you're not using that are just open using up CPU. A uh, common culprit is Google Chrome. If that's your browser, it sucks up so many resources. Or if you have like a video editor open or something else of that nature, something that uses a lot of resources, definitely close that down as you're working in Ableton to make sure that CPU does not overload. Tip number eight is using eco mode in specific plugins. So more and more plugins today are actually giving you the option to adjust the amount of quality of the output of that effect or plugin. And if you adjust this quality, if you lower the quality, it will give you more and more CPU resources. It'll be less of a hog. So if we look at Ableton's reverb device here, if we go into this quality, there's a drop down menu that there's eco, mid and high. And I have this set to eco by default. However, if you're stuck at high quality here, it's gonna be taking significantly more resources than mid. And then eco would be the most energy efficient setting for this plugin. And definitely keep an eye out for other plugins that you have, plugins in Ableton, third party plugins, more and more of them have a quality control that you can adjust how much CPU resources it is taking. So definitely check that out. All right, tip number nine is to use instrument racks instead of a bunch of different tracks for different instruments. And I actually covered how to create an instrument rack in my other video, my top 13 Ableton tips. So I'll link that in the card above if you wanna check that out. But basically what this does is it allows you to have multiple different instruments living inside one instrument rack so that at any given point in time, there's only one instrument within all the instruments that is being used instead of having all of those instruments on different tracks. And the way that Ableton processes data is that if it's on an instrument rack, it will be using less CPU resources than individual tracks. So for example, we have this bass sound here. And if I open up the chain menu, which is this little tiny button at the bottom, click that and you'll see we get this chain selector. And what we can actually do is we can create chains and we can insert new instruments per chain. So if we open up the, the device view here, you'll notice that in this first one, we have a bass sound. In the second chain, we could have another bass sound. We could insert as many chains as we wanted all the way to 127. Then you'll have multiple different instruments that are living on one track in one instrument rack. And you can use a selector to change between them or you could layer them together, whatever your heart desires. But doing this will definitely save you some CPU. All right, the final tip, tip number 10, is to upgrade your computer or buy a whole new computer in general. So if you're serious about music production, investing in a high quality computer, a powerful computer is well worth it because as you know, in the modern music production age, the computer is the central hub of where everything happens. It's where you make all your music. It's what processes all your music, all your mixing, et cetera. So if you had the choice between investing in anything for music production, a computer would be definitely up there on the list. So let's take a peek of what I've got going on. So again, if you can get a solid state hard drive for your computer, that would be great. The more memory, the better. I have 32 gigs of RAM, which is a little bit overkill. However, I would suggest at least 16 if you plan on producing music on your computer or laptop and doing um, high level mixing with a bunch of processing and all this stuff, 16 is what I would recommend. Okay, and you wanna make sure that you have a decently powerful processor to enable you to use as many plugins as you want and process your tracks, mix tracks, all that good stuff. So definitely make sure that you check that out. Okay, so if you have an older laptop, maybe it's worth saving up some money to invest in a newer laptop because laptops today are extremely powerful and can get you like pro level results without even breaking a sweat. If you have a desktop computer and you wanna upgrade it, you could upgrade the RAM, you could upgrade the hard drive, you could upgrade even the processor if you wanted to. So keep that in mind if you've gone through this whole list and you're still having CPU issues while you're recording or while you're trying to finalize a mix, definitely consider investing in an upgrade for your computer or a whole new computer. You really can't go wrong with investing in a high quality computer for 
your music production. And hey, if you're just getting started with music production and feeling completely overwhelmed by the process, or if you've been at this for a while and are having trouble finishing projects, or hey, if you just wanna get a glimpse inside my personal workflow, I've created a super easy to follow seven step framework that helps you go from your first ideas to arranging a song, to editing it, mixing, mastering, and finalizing a song. It's super handy to have around the studio as a printout. So if you're interested in grabbing that, you can find that in the description below. And that wraps it up for this video. I hope it was useful to help you reduce that CPU overload and really avoid those glitches and pops and annoying playback issues for when you're recording or mixing. And hey, let me know, what are your New Year's resolutions in terms of music? What are your musical goals for this year? I'm super excited for this new year, and I would love to hear what you're planning to achieve this next year in the comments below. And with that said, I will leave you and love you and see you in the next video.